Welcome to the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle. On today's episode, I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, Simon Evans. Simon is a stand-up comedian. He has been for 25 years, and he also regularly hosts Headliners, our late night paper preview show. We had a fantastic discussion. We spoke about his origins in stand-up comedy, the culture wars, and how he feels about being one of the few respected right-wing comedians. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Simon, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure. A lot of people will be interested to know how you got into stand-up. Is this a sort of vocation for you? Have you always known this is what you wanted to do? Well, I think I knew I wanted to be funny and I wanted to use words. Um, probably, if not from school days, I think during my time at university, that kind of occurred to me. I went to university to study law. I thought I wanted to be a criminal barrister. And in a way, I think what I really wanted to be was... Uh, Rumpole of the Bailey, and and, in, and to that extent, what I really wanted to be was John Mortimer, you know, who I knew was a barrister and, uh, you know, had, had created this character, was very funny, very witty, and um, and had also adapted Brideshead Revisited, which I thought was what my university days were going to be like as well. So, <laughs> oh, you would have been sorely disappointed. I was in all sorts of important ways, but possibly relieved as well. Anyway, um, but it was 10 years after I left university before I became a stand-up, and it wasn't, I wasn't heading in that direction at all. I was, um, I was trying to get into journalism, and I signed all kinds of different approaches to being able to write, but I didn't want to just write regular reporting for local newspapers or whatever. I ended up doing some of that. I wanted to write features. I wanted to get into columns. I wanted to be like somewhere between Douglas Adams and Alan Corran. That was the kind of territory I wanted to be in, humorous, but I only ever really thought in print. Okay. And then one of these newspapers asked me to write an article about a, uh, a, a group called Spontaneous Combustion who were teaching improvised comedy workshops um, for people who might want to um, enhance their acting skills and for other people who just wanted to unwind on a Wednesday night and have a few laughs and then have a beer. And um, I signed up for this course in order to be able to write about it and that really clicked. That was right. the moment at which I think a light came on for me. And to be honest, I, in a way, I'd almost rather still be doing that, but there's just no money in improv. It's a wonderful uh, exercise, and I do highly recommend it to anyone who wants to um, explore what can I be learned. I find it through. terrifying, mm. the improvisational element. I really do. Yeah, but that's the joy of it. I mean, when you start doing stand-up, for me anyway, I mean, it's like an extreme sport. You know, you know, it's not really dangerous, but the experience of adrenaline rush is very similar. And yet five minutes and it's all over and you just feel, oh, my God, I did it. I'm amazed, you know, and wonderful. And you have a couple of lagers and you just feel like you're king of the world. That kind of dissipates after a few months of doing stand-up. And obviously, every time you play a larger room or the stakes are, are higher, it can come back a little bit. But by and large, you learn how to do it. You know, once you've nailed a routine and you know it works, there's much less at stake. Improv, every night, you know, it, it might fail. So you get that I, feeling I'm, every time. I mean, I can see why that skill would be really helpful as a stand-up comedian, because, yeah. of course, you have to be responsive to what, whatever is happening in the room that particular night. You do. And also... And this is the thing that I hadn't realised, which is really interesting, I think, about improv, is it's a great way of learning about story structure. It's a great way of understanding what makes a scene in a play work, you know, how there has to be a shift in status between the main actors, how everyone has to come in with an objective and somebody will probably have to be thwarted or people might achieve their objective but not in the way they imagined or a negotiation takes place. And sometimes now when I watch a sitcom, The Detectorist was a very good example of this. I, I could... Re I enjoyed it, but I could really see exactly how they created the formula and they mm. do it in not going out as well, which I write for sometimes, which is it starts with a fairly trivial thing, like somebody's trying to get the remote to work on the TV. And the other person comes in and says, what are you doing? I can't get it to switch over. Oh. By the way, we really need to talk about our marriage. Two minutes of discussing their marriage you go, by the way, the remote turn it around and leave it and that's why it wasn't working and you go out. You see what I mean? It's yes. topped and tailed by something trivial, but you have the meat of it, the emotional truth in the middle where it can't hurt anyone. Because yes. And you need to learn things like that to make improv work because improv isn't just about like random scenes. It's about creating the good stuff. It's about creating a long built up sequence. I've seen people improvise from scratch off a single word suggestion, like a 45 minute play that was absolutely riveting where characters go on an emotional journey the equal of anything you see in, in regular theatre. And it's because these people understand how to create story in real time. And that, I think, is just absolutely fascinating. And do you think that kind of story structure element is uh, particularly applicable to stand-up comedy? Or does that come when you develop your longer shows? It's when you develop your longer shows. And when if you want to hold the stage for an hour and a half over the course of an evening, you've got to go on some kind of journey. You know, you've got to take people somewhere where they weren't realising they might end up. Mm. And when they get there... 
they find a lot of other things waiting for them there, which they thought they'd left behind earlier on, but in fact turn out to have been plants. You yes, know, not, yeah. not the, audience the, plants. But no, you yeah, seeded yeah. the ideas yeah, and things. Yeah. So do, do you enjoy that form of stand-up comedy, the more theat theatricalised yeah. form than the club circuit? Oh, I love them both. But there is, I think there's more creative satisfaction to be had creating a longer show. And also you have control of the whole tone of the evening, you know, whereas mm. somebody said to me quite early on, you know, Simon, you have a challenge... Um, you know, and I've been through a few iterations of different persona and so on, but you ha I had a challenge certainly only in the early days, which is that I didn't swear. I presented myself as, you know, almost like a Jacob Rees-Mogg end of the spectrum, <laughs> you know, a kind of really quite buttoned up, repressed and, and slightly old fashioned individual expressing disdain and disappointment with the direction modern society was going in or whatever. And there was always this kind of um, the implication was that I might be about to say something deeply offensive, like the, a delicious teasing the audience is, is about to be racist, about to be sexist, about to say something appalling. Would never do it, you know, but it would just be that kind of, oh my God, yes, he's going to be awful. And that's great and that works very well if the previous act hasn't just come on, effed and blind and dropped C-bombs all over the place and said all the appalling things that I'm now teasing the audience. I also, <laughs> my yeah. ethic about, you know. And so if you can control the room, then you can control the temperature much more successfully. I think you can create a more, you know, more rewarding evening for you, whether it's... But I will say, I think a good comedy club night is as good a, a night as, it, as, it, as there is, you know, from the audience's point of view. You know, I have no kind of snobbery about that. You know, I mean, we both know uh, um, Unleashed is, you know, the, the, the great club in Bethnal Green where we've both worked. And... Um, that has, you know, returned to comedy clubs to their basics and, and it's a fantastically strong evening's entertainment. You know, yeah. the truth is most people probably are at their best over a 20 minute stretch, you know. Yeah, so, no, that's so, right, you know, that's right. And when you, obviously, did this persona idea appeal to you in terms of the stand-up uh, genre? The, the idea of inhabiting something that, that wasn't quite you or at least was a kind of theatricalised version of you? Is that something that is yeah. interesting to you? Well, I did a, a few workshops on stand-up comedy in particular, and it was emphasised when that we, we sort of did. It, they, they, these were not like lessons; they were more like a bunch of people sitting around talking. But there was somebody who was kind of leading the discussion. Yeah, and that was something they 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 prompt uh, they they uh, promoted quite hard. Was that thought that you need to have a persona, and the persona you know the the word persona is Greek originally means mask. It's not quite like a personality. It suggests inflexibility. It suggests a rigidity. Yeah, right. And so it's unchanging is the point, you know. And so the audience know where you're coming from. And that really helps them to, to get it, you know. Yes. A lot, a lot of comedians, American comedians famously come on and invariably tell you something like their, you know, their uh, heritage, their ethnicity, you know. So I'm I'm half Italian, half Norwegian. Ah, go figure, you know, that kind yeah. of, you know, and then they'll have some joke that reflects that. And in Britain, I always thought class was more relevant than race. Yeah. You know, we are, most of our great sitcom characters have been... Um, haunted almost by by fear of being low class or by snobbery or yes. you know mannering and, and and faulty and so on you know so i wanted to play with that a little bit more even though it was coming it was a slightly outmoded thing and i, I mean i don't know if it was a very conscious choice i think sometimes you try on a few jackets literally and find out what fits you know and what you can make work for you but i was aware that i had I studied law at university, as I mentioned. Um, that was coming from a state school from quite a lower middle class family. My grandparents were solidly working class. We, I was the first person to get anywhere near university. My dad had left school at 14. So we were quite kind of, I was not to the manner born, essentially. And 85, 90% of the law faculty were privately educated, I think. So I picked up on that, on those people, the a certain kind of confidence they had, a certain kind of arrogance that they had, a certain... Um, casual disdain that you know they might express for the for the lower orders and so on. Yeah, a bit like Boris in his Bullingdon Club, you know, yeah, the confidence and, of wealth. Right? Yeah, exactly. And I found it a mixture of glamorous, attractive, and contemptible. You know, and it was <laughs> a, you kind of a, a repelled, a, a attracted kind of. And um, and so I I just liked the idea of playing with that really. But it was also, in, in all honesty, again listening to the audience and seeing what they obviously think about me yeah you know so you perform for half an hour the audience will tell you if 
they think you understand yourself or whether they think you're in denial about who you really are. And the constant message I got from them was, um, oh, he's posh, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from. And I assume my accent, but... Um, and how long did you take, did it take for you to work on that open mic circuit before it becomes professional, before you can sustain a living out of this? Really quick, funnily enough. But I think partly because I didn't really have a day job doing the journalism and so on. You know, I okay. had plenty of hours in the day when I could phone up and get get myself onto the next open mic gig. Um, I had no other commitments, you know, and, yeah. and I just quite liked being in those pubs in the evening. So I got lots of stage time quite quickly and I was getting paid work within a few months, three or four months. Because that is very, I mean, the, the way I, I did, I was full-time teacher. When I started earning enough stand-up, I went part-time. Mm. Then I moved into London to a school in London. It was all very gradual because, yeah. because you, it couldn't be any other way. Full-time day job in Ipswich outside London, how could you do it? No. And it is about having that time and space to... I think I was lucky it. that I was in London. I was lucky that I was essentially single, lived in a in a shared house, had very low outgoings, yeah. you know. And um, as I say, well, I say lucky. Actually, those were decisions I'd made. Those were conscious decisions to um, give myself the freedom. You yes. know, I'd, I'd had a, an office job for a few years. I didn't like it. Jacked it in. Went travelling. Came back. Made a sort of sort of swore a sol solemn oath that I would never do that again. Yes. You know, and um, and so found ways to support myself that allowed me to have plenty of free time, really, and the opportunity to to um, invest that in gigging and, and writing material. When you talk about the, the inflexibility of the persona on stage, and I, I often, I'm questioning myself a lot about this because I have uh, sensed a, a kind of um, a lack of trust that has been growing within audiences, that they, they, they sort of allied what they see on stage as a stand-up comic with the persona. They don't really see the difference anymore. They take things at face value mm. more and more. Am I just being sort of reactionary or is this a trend that, is there? You know, it's quite hard for me to say on that front because I now, the bulk of my performances are of two kinds. Either people who've paid to come and see me knowing roughly what they're going to get yeah. over an hour and a half. And then like corporate gigs and so on where I'm actually producing quite a polished, you know, 20 minutes, yes. which isn't going to be... More um, a club set, I suppose. Yeah, more like a club set. But even then, um, less. I mean, I'm aware, you know, with all with all... Um, due respect to my right to free speech and all the rest of it, you know, if you're being paid substantial amount of money to entertain a business yeah. uh, and their and their clients, you know, you don't want to necessarily provoke and absolutely take them to the edge, you know. Yes. So I don't really know what's going on in the comedy clubs in that regard. And my own persona has developed. I think I, I say I've been through at least three different stages. The first 10 years or so was a quite supercilious, unmarried uh, yeah, like uh, almost an American psycho kind of character, you know, yeah. with this just kind of a absolute contempt and disdain for society at large, you know, and, and getting things wrong. A lot of it was obviously irony, you know, jokes about the, um, you know, the, the funny thing about the homeless is loads of them in, in King's Cross. Why, if you're homeless, would you choose to stay in King's Cross? The one advantage of being homeless is you can choose where you live, you know. This but, kind of almost like Prince Charles or something, just misunderstanding a social problem. But that's what I mean is that the, the assumption that the, the audience trusts you enough to know yeah. that that's ironic, sometimes that feels like it's dissipated. I mean, I, I, I had a, a heckler stand up and accuse me of misogyny for taking something I said completely at face value. Yeah. But I had, until that point, I'd always assumed that audiences would trust that I obviously don't think that. And this felt like a new thing to me. I think that is possibly a new thing. And I do think those people are out there, touch wood, they don't come to my shows very often, right, you know, okay. and they don't misunderstand what I'm doing. But um, in Edinburgh last year, I played in, a, in one of these Spiegel tents. It was the biggest room, I, because I only went up for a week and it was a very compromised festival, but it was great in some ways. I had big audiences and there was not much competition on. But it did mean I had some people come along who had never seen me before and that was the only game in town. You know? Yes. And um, I do a bit in my current show about uh, trans and I don't think it is particularly sort of provocative or confrontational, but it's teasing, certainly, and it points out some of the incoherent sort of, uh, you know, um, consequences of, of self-ID and so on. Yes. And I, I had a couple of walkouts and they left before, of course, I get onto the bit towards the end of the show where all of that comes back and turns around and the tables are turned on me and I make revelations that about my own um uh hormone uh profile which i had you know had a, a test like a blood test done and discovered that i actually was very low t myself discovered having sort of like ascribed all this weird behavior to everyone being low t and drinking soy so they didn't see that it was kind of there was a self-deprecating yes. second you know second shoe that fell but um 
They walked out, and on the way out, as far as I understand it, they passed in front of house staff who knew nothing about me and had never seen me before. And they said, where are you, where are you going? What's the matter? And they said, disgusting, he's doing anti-trans material or something. And then I got an email from the venue saying, we've had, just to let you know, we've had complaints from some of the venue staff um, that you're doing anti-trans material and it makes them feel unsafe. And without going into too much detail, because they handled it fine, the venue and everything, yeah. you know, this is, this is the sort of thing that can happen now. It's a sort of Chinese whispers. These people hadn't even seen the material. They didn't know what they were talking about and they didn't know the context into which eventually it is enfolded in the course of the show. But that is definitely something that's happening now and it is something comedians need to be aware of. And it is, of course, a problem. As soon as, as I say, you have attract new people who don't understand that there might be some irony, that they don't understand that there might be some context, you know. It's so that is know, difficult. It's difficult to know whether that's a sincere thing, whether they literally have, you know, whether they've lost the capacity to understand irony or whether they are weaponizing the complaint system. Yeah. And, and particularly that notion of safety. Because, you know, if you say to someone, I'm unsafe, it's suddenly a health and safety issue. It's not yeah, just yeah. A, a criticism. No, exactly. The whole thing has to be shut down, doesn't it? Yeah. To, to be fair to the venue, as I say, they stood their ground and I'm grateful for them doing so. But yes. I think they, um, I think it, it's, well, it's an unresolved issue at this point. I think you're absolutely right. But I, I, I try not to think that it's necessarily used cynically. I think... I do think a lot of young people do experience a degree of not feeling safe now. Mm. There's a book, you're probably familiar with it, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, and it makes quite alarming reading, you know, the yeah. extent to which young people do experience the world, not, not the literally physical, violent, threatening world of dangerous dogs and drug addicts and so on, but, but also of, of um, the notion that challenging their identity is challenging their right to exist. You know, they, they frame things in their mind in a way that makes it very, very difficult to have a, a serious conversation. Well, I also think there are implications for the arts with that. I mean, this is my concern about the likes of trigger warnings. It's not because I think there's any big deal, you know, warning someone that they might be upset by the content. It's more that what it suggests uh, about books, about the idea mm. that these are little grenades primed to explode. These are yeah. dangerous things. And, and that, that, that discourse troubles me a little bit. Well, there's a famous quote, isn't there? Kafka, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but something along the lines of every book should be an ax taken to the frozen sea within. You know, that's a good thing. You know, these books should explode in your brain. Yes. You know, um, otherwise, why? Why read? You know, why not just go out and live? Because books should be able to give you more vivid, challenging experiences than you are likely to encounter on the on the high street. But um, if you feel that your mental health depends on not encountering such ideas, mm. then you will be afraid. You know, yes. you will think this is setting me up to experience a trauma which I might never quite escape from. Yeah. As Haidt Lukianov say, exactly the opposite is true. You know, Nietzsche may have overstated it. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. But he had the right idea. You know, you oh, yeah. have to you have to. It's a Talib as well with his anti-fragility. You have we are anti-fragile, no, not simply robust, but actually improved. We strengthen through impact. You know, in the same way that the best way to remain young is to lift heavy weights and and to and to jump up and down. You know, and yeah. land with impact on your poor fragile bones because that will strengthen them. You know, the same thing occurs to your brain. Yes, and I hadn't realised till I read that book that you know there, there is a consensus amongst cognitive behavioral therapist that the worst thing you can do is shield yourself from the potential for absolutely for reignition of trauma you know mm. you, you, you have to live in the world as it is yeah and 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 when it's when the trauma is fresh it might help to say listen there is an incident in this book which is uncannily similar to the uh, unpleasant experience you had last summer yes so you know just brace yourself for that but then, that's all, that's it, you know, so not, you can therefore be excused, yes. you know, from this semester or whatever. But I mean, this does have particular implications for comedy. And when I do end up finding someone I can talk to from that side of the argument, because they rarely do want to speak, um, they will say, you know, it's when I go to a comedy club, I, I, I have no guarantee that I won't hear something that will reignite that tra trauma or that mm. will, be, will feel like an attack. And mm. that's not fair. So what we need to do is sanitize the comedy clubs and make yeah. sure that those things don't just don't happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, is that just a threat that's in my imagination or do I, is there something that is, uh, is the art form being compromised? Of course it is, yeah. It used to be, as everyone has been saying for some time, it's completely flipped over as well. The whole point of the left 
in, in the arts was to challenge you with things that might unsettle you and might cause you to reflect upon something unpleasant. I mean, not to make you revisit, you know, a, a an unprovoked rape or something, you know, but certainly things that you've been trying to suppress. The point of the arts is it, it breaks up that surface and yeah. those things come out and, and, and then disappear screaming into the night, you know, like, like, uh, like those weird fizz bang fireworks, you know, yeah. and then they no longer trouble you. There was, a, who was the, um, there was a female sort of performance artist, stroke comedian who was, she was a big friend of Madonna's many years ago. Uh, Bernhardt, was it Sarah? Oh yes, Sarah Bernhardt. Sarah Bernhardt. Yeah. She did a live show, which I went to, I can't remember if I saw it on film or in, or, or whether it was a theater, but a friend of mine was a big fan anyway. I didn't, to be honest, enjoy it exactly, but it was extraordinarily confrontational, you yes. know. In, in what I just don't think it would be even imaginable now. You know, it was really goading you. You know, yeah. it was like, uh, you know, are you turned on by this? Are you afraid of this? What is it inside you that doesn't like this? You know, it was really, I mean, I, you know, and, and that was obviously considered to be a thing of the left. Yes. You know, you would have expected to see Mary Whitehouse outside that, not... You know, the, the TRAs or whatever. Well, I'm interested in this particularly because some of the most shocking uh, theatrical things I've ever seen were when I was younger, going on the gay scene and seeing yeah. sort of uh, going to the Royal Vauxhall Tavern and seeing mm. some of the extreme cabaret drag performance art stuff, yeah. which could be quite visceral and, 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 and terrifying often. And then, you know, someone sent me a, um, an image from a, uh, a poster that's now up in the Royal Vauxhall Tavern saying, we will not tolerate this phobia, that phobia, this phobia within the performance. Yeah. And I'm thinking, no, I haven't been back for a few years, but I can't imagine those acts na that I knew performing in those venues now. I don't know how that would work with the hyper fragility or sensitivity within that LGBTQIA Community. I did play the Vauxhall Tavern once. I remember it's not was, good was, to play. There was a there was a <laughs> sort of comedy, you know, gay friendly comedy night, and I was on in the middle. And all I remember, I did not get many laughs, and then um, audibly heckled along the lines of, mm, "Well, it's quite good looking." <laughs> it. It was referred wow. to as it, and I've never had anything anything remotely as hostile like that. It was really quite, I, I mean, I do remember shrinking, you know. Yeah. And I'm also, of course, being flattered that I was being regarded as quite yeah. good looking. But being, being sexually objective. Exactly, <laughs> you know, but that was, um, I do remember thinking that is extraordinary how, um, you know, n never in, in years, I may have happened to female comics, but I still don't think many female comics in regular comedy clubs get referred to not merely as a gender neutral, but as a degendered, you know, yeah. pronoun. Yeah. And um, I think back to that quite often when I think about the the ongoing debate about, you know, what will be tolerated and thinking that was that was in amongst the most supposedly vulnerable and marginalized people, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. You know. Well, there was a resilience there. You know, I, yeah. I remember I, I, there was something about the, the space of Oxford. When I did stand up there, it didn't feel like it was working. Uh, even as a gay act in a gay space, but um, yeah. but yeah, there was a there was a toughness. Mm. You know, I've seen bloodshed and all sorts of stuff on yeah, stage. Yeah. You know, actual bloodshed. Yeah, and it's, it's well, it's like those clubs that are described in Jacques Brel songs and stuff, isn't it? You know, those you can know, dockside, you know, and uh, sailors drinking and fornicating in the yeah. in the sawdust. You know. Miss that a little bit, really. There's something, well, there's something quite exciting. <laughs> uh, one show I saw, there, a fight broke out because the, the performer had created such a division within the crowd. People were jeering at each other and a fight broke out. Wow. And, you, you know, there's nothing more exhilarating than that. It's probably not healthy, but, you know. I had a fight on stage only once. At really? Da Hems, which is, uh, it was called a Rangy Boom Boom. A Rangy Boom being a Dutch lager. Da Hems is a... Uh, Dutch pub on the edge of Chinatown, just on Shaftesbury Avenue. I, I don't know you it, can see it. Yeah, big pub. They would record a. Um, they record no. They tried out. It was Richard Blackwood. I don't know if you remember him. Yes. Who used to? Um, he had his own TV show on Channel Four at the time, and he would try out new material for that show there. Yeah. So it would always get a fairly decent sized crowd, and the rest of us were just like open spots and stuff. Um, but one night I was, I think I was actually hosting the show, and there was this drunken fellow, and he was just constantly interrupting. And eventually, I snapped at him. You know, come on then, mate. Are you going to, yeah. you know, wow. uh, come and have a go? <laughs> and he did. He came up on stage. And then there was a sort of bit of a, a, a sort of good nature, but it could have got gone nasty kind of wrestling push about. Nobody threw a punch or anything. There was a bit of grappling and, right. gone, and I got him back, sat down again. He was quite drunk. Carried on really with my heart racing now. But when that evening finished, I was like, 
you know, like the King of New York. It was amazing. You yeah. know, I was like, because <laughs> you do get this feel of, of invulnerability as a stand-up, yeah, yeah. but it's an illusion, right? I mean, yeah, they could yeah. just rush the absolutely, stage. Absolutely, absolutely. But if you cope with it, I always, I would always want to. But I say always, it's not been that long. But I have yet to hear a detailed explanation from. Uh, Chris Rock of how he felt after being attacked um, yeah. at the Oscars because I think he coped incredibly well with I that. I'm, I'm going to assume it wasn't planned. Some people have said, oh, interesting that Pfizer is launching a new uh, cure for alopecia. Yeah, I, don't think so. no. I don't think so. But um, yeah, assuming that really came out of nowhere, he just coped admirably, you know, and, and kept his cool and laughed about it, you know. It was incredible. It, yeah. But I do wonder whether having done so, he went up and down and, you know, in and out and over the over the, the roller coaster. I, on that night after De Hems, I was a, a single man at the time, um, picked up a woman in uh, in the club and ended up having sex with her that night. And it's the only time I've ever done that after a, after a performance on a comedy stage. I, I essentially went onto a bar with a woman who'd been in the audience and I ended up going back to hers. Do you think that's because of the confidence? I totally that... do. I think it was the testosterone rush or whatever it was or whatever, you know, adrenaline, cortisol, whatever the, the, the chemical... Yeah. cocktail was it absolutely in my mind there's no question it was a linear progression from having essentially one or at least physically dealt with a threat that's amazing i mean if, if someone yeah. had been filming that night as well yeah it would have gone viral wouldn't it that'd be it precisely would. the I kind would of been, you know it'd have been the new jim jeffries <laughs> but uh sadly not it, um there's there are a lot of people now talking about this this growing risk of people because of this uh strangely aggressive form of claims of fragility you know where yeah a activists say they're so vulnerable that they have to attack yeah yeah <laughs> you know and 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 then of course there was the uh, uh the attack on stage against dave Chappelle. yeah about three weeks after the i mean is this a trend that we need to worry about or i would i mean i assume that guy was partly inspired by uh by will smith but i at the same time there are always crazies aren't there yes um, yeah. and i think america is a little bit more crazy oriented and also, to be fair, Dave Chappelle has been pushing buttons a lot. You yes, know? yeah. I like his stuff and I totally support his right to do so. But to the extent that people go, that's quite brave. Well, that's why it's quite brave. Yeah, yeah. You know, so... But people have always... I mean, Sadowitz, I think, was punched in Canada. I would certainly imagine um, he's been a approached a few times. I mean, yeah. he could be extraordinarily much, much worse, more offensive, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By, by far. But yeah. it's just that his stuff isn't out there on... TV no. or the internet. And also and, people recognise that there's something a bit not quite right with him. You know, yeah, they can yeah, see that it's a, you know, act, right? Yeah. He plays yeah. on that. He is part of the act, but also I think people recognise it's not entirely part of the act. Right. I think they probably know he's quite troubled. Chappelle, multimillionaire at the very least, you yeah, know, yeah, had yeah. good life and uh, armed limo and all the rest of it. Sadovitz, you know, walking around like a strange kind of gothic cartoon character in, <laughs> in Clerkenwell. You know, yeah, it's you difficult can... to see how he could punch up. Right? Yeah, or exactly. Punch down, punch sorry, punch down. down. Exactly, be... that's part of it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You've, you've, do you feel that, I mean, a lot of people often say that you're one of the um, comics who is perceived to be on the right, or at least leaning that way, who, who is accepted as such and embraced yeah. uh, by comedians generally, because, because the comedy industry is not very welcoming of dissenters um, from the establishment line. But you and I think Jeff Norcott probably are the only ones where who are respected by left-wing comics, I suppose. Well, that's nice. I mean, I think the thing about it is partly, me and Jeff are quite different, actually, in that regard. Mm. I very rarely actually um, support Tory policies, except in a quite tongue-in-cheek kind of way. Right. As I say, in the same, I support the monarchy. You know, I'm yeah. quite, quite a reactionary. But um, it's more a question of attacking Corbyn or just drawing attention to you know, the, the failure of, of Labour to come, or indeed the failure of the Democrats in America after four years of Donald Trump to come up with a better candidate than Joe Biden. You know, yeah. that kind of thing, I think, needs saying. It doesn't mean that you have to support all the policies of the right, you know. Yeah. But I think also it's partly, um, whereas, I mean, with, with, with Jeff Norcott, he, he would actually say, I vote Conservative, whereas I would say a bit more like Peter Hitchens, you know, it's all over. Right, OK, OK. <laughs> There's nothing left to conserve. But... Um, but also, having been doing it for over 25 years, I suppose I was bedded in before Brexit, which Brexit is what broke everything. Absolutely. You know, Brexit is what just inflamed everything. And now the, the wound won't knit together again. Do you think there's much in this whole debate? I mean, we keep hearing it, don't we, about right wing comedy and, and all the rest of it. Do you think there's anything in this or is this just something that is sort of fabricated by, by the media? Is there such a thing as right wing, right -wing comedy? comedy. Well, I think there's certainly reactionary comedy. As I've said, I, funny enough, one of the first sort of podcasts I did like this was with, um, uh, I don't remember his name, there's Comedian's Comedian, Sam, uh, what's his name? Gold oh, Goldsmith. Goldsmith, yeah. yeah. And we talked about this and he said, you know, 
isn't right wing comedy isn't that punching down? Is that that's a complete misunderstanding of it? Is it not possible to you know to be a right wing comedian without just essentially bullying? And I'd say the whole point of right wing comedy, which is which far pre exists supposedly left wing comedy and is actually a far more fundamental comedic sensibility, mm. is to recognise that we're all buggered. You know, we're all flawed we're all we're all limited we all make bad choices you know the world is an endless series of bad compromises you know, yes. there, there are no saviors you know the left is not going to save you you know and and yes maybe it would be nice if marcus rashford you know was was chancellor of the exchequer you know <laughs> for a week but the truth is the the world is very very hard to get right and you all have to you're much better off adapting yourself to the reality, taking responsibility for yourself and expecting everything to go wrong. Pessimism, essentially, is is comedic. Yes. You know, and it has always been, you know, things like Jonathan Swift, Tristram Shandy, you know, Alexander Pope, Samuel Johnson. These are the, these are the, like the birth of English wit. Yes. You know, do you think they were left wing? Of course they weren't left wing. You know, they were absolutely reactionary. You know, some of the funniest writers of the of this 20th century, you know, perceived inanimate objects to have a, a cruel and vindictive agenda against them. You know, yeah, yeah. you know, it doesn't mean that you, you want the welfare state to be wound up and, and people to, you know, go back to the poorhouse or the workhouse if they, you know, it's not about, it's not, it's not a political notion. It's a, it's a sense, it's a disposition. Yeah. And it's about making the best of things now, as Michael Oakeshott, probably the greatest right wing or conservative philosopher, the English philosopher of the 20th century. It's a, it's a, to be right wing, to be conservative is about preferring present laughter to utopian bliss. You know, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's about being jolly, you know, it's being, it's full stuff, you know, yeah. it's, it's not, it's not some sort of, it's, again, it's not, I mean, unless you're doing it tongue in cheek, it's not actually about being Jacob Rees-Mogg. I don't think they know what they mean when they say right wing comedy. I think what they mean is racist comedy. Yeah. I think, or, 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 or when, when the media, often, when, when you see articles about, uh, you know, we need more right wing comedy on mm. the BBC or whatever, it feels like what they mean is we need comedians who are willing to mock things other than the prevailing norm, as yeah. in all Brexit voters are stupid or racist, that's become boring. Well, you could argue that right-wing comedy is predicated on one simple proposition, which is that there is such a thing as human nature. Mm. You okay. know, that we're not endlessly improvable or that we are not blank slates. Yes. You know, and saying that we're not blank slates was enough to get Stephen Pinker, you know, branded as a, as a, 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 yeah, providing sucker and aid to the alt-right. You know, yeah. so... Maybe that's true. And I suppose you could say that racism fundamentally is a, is a division of that, you know, yeah. to say that there is, you know, that there's any difference between us. The difference, I suppose, could easily be, you know, there's an awful lot of black comedians who have always traded in what is by any, like, objective definition, racist comedy. They say white people do this and black people yeah. do that, you know. But that's, that is racism, right? Except... That racism usually comes now with this kind of caveat that it can only be practiced when it is in support of an underlying systemic structure that right. so you know guarantees you that your side is going to win. The but definition means the redefinition means it can't be racist. It can't be racist, yeah. you yeah. know. But to me, racism is simply the acknowledgement or the assertion, you might say, maybe acknowledgement begs the question, the assertion that race is a meaningful construct. You know, yes. race 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 refers to something that exists in the real world. Now, I personally am not that interested in whether or not that's true. And I don't do a lot of material about that, not because I'm afraid of it, but just because it's not where I find, you know, the, the interesting things. But I do, for instance, think that men and women are different. Well, that might be, that is also perhaps a right-wing proposition, that there is something not only about the bone strength and upper body strength of, of male bodied people, but there is also, there are some tendencies hardwired yes. into us that make us different from women. And that some women are male brained and some men are female brained, as you might say as a shorthand, is also a perfectly legitimate thing to explore in comedy. I don't even know whether those things are true, but if you tell jokes predicated on that premise yes. and people laugh, that suggests that they've recognized something that in there right. that's true, you know. I mean, it just strikes me that a lot of these debates are based on illusions. I mean, when we set up Comedy Unleashed, you know, we were told we were accused of setting up a right wing night so we could platform lots of racists such as yeah. Bernard Manning. So yeah, basically, yeah. they listed a couple of people who haven't been alive for decades. Yeah. 
which that's their frame of reference for right-wing comedy. Also, it's set up and run by two lefties. So the whole thing was based on sort of an illusion. People do confuse right-wing comedy very often with comedy that's simply dated, but that probably reflects the fact that in terms of the television and what a lot of people see their comedy, enough left-wing people or progressive people or whatever they would call themselves got into positions of power within the BBC and elsewhere and stopped there being any right-wing comedian. So the last time they saw any, it was like Jim Davison and Bernard Manning, and that was 20 or 30 years ago. And so they don't, they can't see how, co I mean, if you said left-wing comedy, then who would that have referred to in, in 1975? Yes. You know, who, who would have been a left-wing comedian at that point? Um, like, yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, one of those guys from the Chicago 7 or something, you know? But, like, you know. <laughs> but then I've, I've seen you cited as a proof that oh, right-wing comedians are yeah. platforms on TV and all the, all the rest of it. Well, I mean, I, I have to be very careful not to sound like I'm whining, but I, d I don't mind that I don't get on TV. I haven't been on TV very much at all in the last 10 years, and maybe that's my fault. Maybe I should have targeted my career towards that more. I don't know. But um, the only thing that angers me is when you know, uh, a Guardian article or something will yeah. say uh, there are, the simple real fact is there aren't any, there aren't very many right wing comedians. This is why you never see them on television. This is why people like Simon Evans and Jeff Norcott are never off our screens because they're always being booked because they're the only available right wing comedians. I mean, I literally haven't done Mock the Week since 2011, and I very much doubt I'll ever do it again. I've done two Live at the Apollos, but the last one of those was, I think, 2012. Mm. So it's 10 years. I've done no other BBC comedy. I've, I've been on Pointless Celebrities. That was it. Right. You know, uh, I've done a couple of question times and a, and a you know, a celebrity mastermind. But, but not no, a comedy show. No such, other yeah. comedy shows. I've never been invited on Have I Got News For You. Not once. Yeah. yeah. Never been offered that. That's over 20 years now that's been on the telly. If they were desperate to have right-wing comedians on and, and, they, and there is this, uh, this consensus that there's a dearth, yeah. then I think I would have had the call. I don't think they have any interest in having us. It's interesting. I mean, I, 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 you can tell me if I'm Im imagining this, but I feel very much that the industry itself and the gatekeepers of the comedy industry are very much uh, intolerant of, of anyone who steps out of line. And I, you know, I mean, the reaction to when Headliners started was really telling in that comedians decided it was this evil thing that had been set up to promote right wing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's so detached from reality yeah. and yet peddled by the big comedy names, you know? There was a lot of, it's interesting, there wasn't a huge amount of scorn or spite from well-established comedians, I thought. There were one or two exceptions, and I challenged one or two of them on Twitter yeah, about yeah. it, you know, and they sort of backed away from saying, well, you know, not you, Simon, but, you know. <laughs> but um, they had that kind of strange, it's not, it's not unique to headliners, you see it quite a bit, where it's like you're both a threat to democracy and you're shouting in an empty room, you know, and yeah. I was listening. And I think it's just an attempt to attack, to make you feel, you know, um, destabilised, to put you on the back foot. Yeah. You just have to ignore it. But it's been quite interesting, in the same way that, you know, uh, occasionally like a footballer will use a very unpleasant term to, to you know, reference another footballer yeah. on the field of play, and you think... Is that a reflection of how they think generally, or are they just trying to say the most wounding thing yes. they can? It's yeah. definitely the latter. But um, I think in, what is it, six months since Headliners in November it started? Yeah. It's really evaporated. I yes, mean, I've been has, very, very pleased to see that. I don't think anyone now in the comedy industry is still trying to claim that it is, uh, that our show at least is, is any kind of betrayal of the principles of comedy. Yeah. Some people might not think it's as funny as it should be. And I always say to them, well, listen, you know, it's, it's completely unscripted. We, we get the papers, we have two hours to, to go through them. Yeah. I'm pretty pleased with what we're doing, you know, and getting the balance right. And remember, we also have to actually give an honest account of what the story is before we then try and get in a yeah. gag. And I personally think it benefits much more from having real dialogue and banter rather than, than like here are my three jokes I've written about it but whether people like it or not it's generally the, the, you know the crosshairs have moved on you know yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the coyotes are no longer sort of circling the, the campfire yeah. and um, or hyenas or whatever the, the dangerous Some ones are dangerous yeah, animal yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm really pleased about it and, and also I mean you yourself you know have done a great job in terms of bringing in plenty of people from the left and plenty of people who represent Britain's diversity in all, you know, across all the, the various uh, spectra of, of race and, and, and religion and, and, and sex and, and orientation, all the rest of it. So, you know, I don't think there's anything for them. I don't think we're showing them any flag. No, that's, I mean, because 
if you watch it, you can't really, those no. complaints are clearly not founded. So, no. so they do just sort of go away, which is reassuring. Yeah. But I suppose what I mean is um, as well, a, a kind of just a sense. I remember when I went to Edinburgh a few years ago, and it was the first time I really noticed uh, people who I've known for years just moving away. They couldn't be seen to be near me. You know, the, yeah. this kind of ostracization of anyone who's... So maybe Brexit was the thing that really blew it all apart because wow. there were a few of us that were pro I did a thing you know. for Radio 4 about uh, five years ago. No, four, four years ago, maybe. Shortly after Brexit, anyway. A couple of years afterwards, just saying, I'd noticed that far more people were referring to me being right-wing than anything else suddenly. yes. And I wonder what it was. And it seemed to me that it was 2016, obviously Trump as well. Yeah. Although yeah. we have a terribly, you know, pathological habit in this country of sort of assuming that we live under, a, you know, an American hegemony when we really don't yeah. need to think that. But yeah. So uh, Brexit and, and Trump. And, um, and it, it did seem, I think, to the left as if there was some terrible populist wave that was going to definitely end up with uh, goose stepping down the high street, you know, and, <laughs> and, yeah. and people being rounded up and shot and put on ferries and, you know, send them back and all the rest of it. And, of course, the, the bizarre and I think still unacknowledged paradox is that after Brexit, there's been more immigration than ever, and the British are much less anxious about it. You yes. know, they are endlessly polled. They express considerably more relaxed attitudes towards the immigration, which is now coming from further afield than Europe. You know, it, the idea that it turned us all overnight, released or empowered or... Uh, what's what's the word they always use? Uh, uh, normalised you know, or legitimised? Legi yeah, yeah, encouraged racists and just yeah. sort of made them feel they could come out and start spewing their hatred and vitriol. You know, the tiny handful of supposed hate incidents that actually emerged out of this, you know, when you read into them were almost always, you know... Um, oh, Polish man assaulted on the tube, get down to the third paragraph, assaulted by some black British teenagers because he had been issuing horrific racial slurs at them right. that you nobody would expect them to put up with if the other bloke had been English, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're it's it's like all these stories, they just they just shattered this illusion, but it became an absolute mantra for the for the for a certain kind of mindset in British comedy that, that we were on the slide towards fascism and consequently if you were seen to be giving any kind of and I said at the time and I still say I did not vote for Brexit and if I'm absolutely honest on balance I still kind of wish we probably had stayed. Right. I think that would have been my preference. I don't like unnecessary upheavals and change. I can see they are necessary <laughs> sometimes, but it was un it was unmooring, it was unsettling. All I ever really did was defend my father's right to vote for it and say, I'm sorry, he's not a racist. These are his views, or these are his, his thinking. It may not be as sophisticated as some of you, but he's read a newspaper for every day for the last 40 years since voting enthusiastically to join in 1974 or whenever it was, or yeah. remain within. He has, um, his views have gradually changed. They've evolved. That's how democracy works. If you don't like it, then I'm sorry, you need to recognize that this is, there are compromises and limitations to living in a democracy. And occasionally yeah. things don't go your way. It doesn't mean everyone is turning into Hitler. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I was, I, I know that this was believed by people. I spoke to Graham Linehan about this. Um, he says that when, because he was having a spat with me online a number of years ago, and he was yeah. saying that he was so, com he said that, he doesn't trust anything that he said or thought back then because he was so convinced yeah. that we were in the grip of of the new Third Reich, you yeah. know, that, that, that this was happening. And of course, the far right, however dangerous they are, are very much marginal. They fizzled, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was quite, I don't know about the far right in this country. I honestly don't, I don't think they're even, I don't think they're marginal. I just don't think they exist. I'm sorry. I mean, there are a few, a handful of people with mental illness, like the, the bloke who shot uh, stabbed um, Joe, Joe Cox. Joe yeah, Cox, yeah. yeah. And, and you see them on Twitter business. from time to time, pop, you know. Tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny handful. There are some like Morrissey who will raise the uh, observation that the, the, the North that they grew up in has changed dramatically. And, and, and perhaps that is a, a sad thing that they can't cope that, with that, that people yes. are happier generally if they are more flexible about the changing reality. You know, but things do change. If you stare at a cloud long enough, it no longer resembles a whale. Now it's some, <laughs> sort, of, some sort of weird dog. <laughs> and this is just how the world is, you know, and it can be challenging for some people. In America, I think there's something stronger. There is, Absolutely. you know, there is uh, America first, there is white supremacy, and they are genuinely, you know, a threat. And also, I think, conceivably, you know, some of the frog stuff, the Kekistan business, you know, that got Donald Trump in, the 4chan stuff, if I'm honest, was quite funny, some of it. You know, yeah. there was a certain kind of, as Jordan Peterson said, you know, a lot of it was just teenage satire. It was just kids And it wasn't a lot of young about. people. It they was. were young and they had basically had enough of 
organized politics. They thought, uh, you know, they essentially a, a pox on both your houses and they yeah. didn't see Donald Trump as a, a regular, you know, as the, the new Reagan. They, they saw him as a, a complete iconoclast. You know, they wanted to get a bull into the China shop, essentially. Yeah, and that's yeah. what they managed to do, you know. Now, whether or not Trump was a good thing or a bad thing for America, I think remains to be seen. But the way, the degree, again, to which he was portrayed as being, you know, tipping them right over into the into the abyss. Oh, I was mad. I mean, there, there's a real glee to it, the way that things are misrepresented. The, 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 the way, I mean, you remember uh, the one year anniversary of the 6th of January yeah. uh, incursion and, and Nancy Pelosi talking about... It was the same as Pearl Harbor. It was the same as 9-11. It, it, was, yeah. it was a few guys in horns, as far as I could it see. Was pa it's pathetic. And they abs and I am quite convinced, and I talked to several friends about this, and this is something on which I will go out. I guess you might call me a truther, but I'm absolutely persuaded that the incursion, which is a good word for it, was lured into the capital on that day by deliberately, you know, absent security. It was an extraordinary standing down of on a day like that with all of the anticipated trouble that they had, that they could basically just go up to a fire door and essentially be ushered in. I mean, there's footage of them being shown in. Well, you can see them sort of wandering around. It doesn't look it's like ridiculous. a... It's ridiculous. They don't expect to get in. It was, it was, I mean, you could argue it was brilliantly done by whoever did it, you know, whoever managed to coordinate that exercise, but it wouldn't take very much. It's essentially just saying, I don't know what, Let's just not have the police there that day. Do you Let really them think? get him. I, oh, really I mean, do I mean, think. I'm, you know, I think. And it's I don't generally hold with theories of that kind, but it yeah. makes zero sense to me that they would get in if there had been. You only have to look at the way that they are around. Look at what they, they were around the Supreme Court after there was that leaked document saying that Roe v. Wade was going to be re-examined. Yes, yes. They were like, like armed guards, sixteen deep. You know, uh, a barbed wire and 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 uh, and, and huge. Um, concrete barriers yes. you know to keep out the anti like the, to keep out the pro-abortion or yeah, whatever you yeah, want yeah. to call that anti, anti pro-life i mean it is it, it, you know I, I what bothers me about it what really troubles me about it, i mean i do think it's wrong P these people shouldn't have been going in places where they shouldn't go and no. uh, you know and, and i but think by it was, getting them in there it, it weaponized me exactly as you say and it, it made it look as if donald trump was not simply a defeated candidate and it, he absolutely backed himself into this corner yeah, you yeah. know but it made him look not simply as a defeated candidate, but as a, as a you know, a state security threat. Yeah. And it made the Republican Party look absolutely um, compromised and, and tainted with any support they might continue to have. If he does stand again as the candidate in 2024, then yeah. they will very easily be able to say, sorry, you want to re-elect the guy who tried to launch a fascist coup right, last time right. when he lost the vote? But, but they're, that, in, they're in deep trouble with that, you know, so it's brilliantly handled. But, but that's my concern about it is that, yeah. the, the, uh, you know, we're used to elements of the media lying and politicians lying and misrepresentation, all the rest of it. But this is the first time really where you have mass misrepresentation that we can all see as false. Yeah. You know, we know that wasn't a fascist coup because we, we can still look yeah. at the footage. As indeed we knew that Trump was lying when he said that his, his was the best attended in, inauguration it's, in well, history. Well, that was another you know, ex perfect example. Yeah. We had the photographs. Yeah, I know. But it's this new thing of... Of, of, of politicians in the media being willing to lie when the evidence of our eyes tells us that yeah. it's a lie. That, that to me is chilling, actually. I mean, I think it's interesting that Boris is on the ropes now, seriously on the ropes, and it remains very largely around Partygate. Yeah. And I think Partygate was, an inter it is because it is in that modern era. I understand that some people feel much more strongly about it than I'm inclined to do. I, I honestly don't feel uh, as vindictive about it. Maybe it's because I didn't watch Granny die on FaceTime, you know, but I just kind of think... You know, there was a there was a culture of allowing perhaps a little bit too much latitude to people who were working very long hours and had a few drinks after work. And yes, we were all confused. What I would like to see, to be honest, is an amnesty on everyone who was fined under those rules right. and regulations, a return of anyone who paid anything over 50 quid should get all their money back. And I think there should be all those records should be wiped clean and, the, you know, all the fixed penalty notices returned. It, they tried to do their job at the time. It was misjudged. But what I think we are seeing and what we saw with him trying to evade responsibility for that in the House of Commons, he may or may not have misled the Commons. It looks to me as if, you know, on a t on a technically speaking, if you're inclined to be harsh, yes, he did. He lied. And that is a, a sacking offence. Yeah. But it's no worse to me morally than, for instance, what Tony Blair did in order to justify the Iraq war, the sexing up of the dossier, the yes. misrepresentation of the threat that Saddam Hussein represented to the British Isles and to British security, to British armed forces. 
drew us into arguably the greatest catastrophe of the century so far, the Iraq war, which, which killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and destabilized the region and, and, and a cascade of, of tragedies that followed after yes. that. It is no worse, in my view, to the lies which Bill Clinton told in order to escape uh, his fate when, it, yep. when his various sexual improprieties became to light. And it's certainly no worse than the lies and the dishonesty of his wife when she tried to undermine and dishonor the testimony of his various victims mm. in order to maintain the possibility of her own political career. Yes. And she's supposed to be the one who was the shining knight that we rejected in favor of the, you know, the, the disgusting orc like figure of Trump. You know, you can't find a greater exemplar of the supposed virtue of the left than Hillary Rodham Clinton. She lied and lied and lied. Yeah. Christopher Hitchens wrote a great book about the, the couple. No, no one left to lie to. Yes. You know, yeah. this is not a new thing in politics. Get rid of Johnson by all means. I don't think he's any great shakes on all sorts of more important criteria than whether or not he's trying to cover up, cover his back on this drinking after hours drinking culture thing. But let's not pretend he's some brand new kind of strain of, of, pathogen in, in British politics, which is willing to fudge the truth a little bit. The whole Good Friday Agreement is a fudge. It's yeah. a lie, essentially. You know, you're allowed to believe in some things that obviously don't add up in order to achieve peace. He was just trying to do that as a great tradition of fudge in British politics. I think but people present uh, Boris Johnson as being a sort of a singular phenomenon. You know, Peter Oberon wrote that book, yeah. The Assault on Truth, which does, to be fair to him, source and catalogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he does lie and has been caught lying. Um, and but, but but Peter Oberon's argument is that this is this is unprecedented. Yeah, but it's not really, is it? He has been a, he's been a liar his whole life. He is definitely is somebody who uses laugh l lies and what he perceives to be his charm, which does seem to have got him there. So I suppose you yeah, know people even do accept it. They're like, oh, well, that's Boris. It so, is you know. weird. But then they lie as well. For instance, Led by Donkeys put out an eight-minute video, which I watched uh, yesterday, about the, the, you know, the whole career of Boris Johnson, how he created a persona and the Bullingdon Club and the bullying of yes. waiters and so on, much of which I've taken at face value because I've been told that it's true, even though I wasn't there or whatever. But then almost every time I encounter something which I do know something about, I find they are lying. For instance, every time they present him as having written a column in The Spectator in which he, they simply say, called young black children pickaninnies and, and grinning, grinning pickaninnies and so on and watermelon smiles. I read that column at the time and I've reread it several times since to absolutely put my mind at rest. He is he is parodying, he is pastiching, he is satirizing the Commonwealth Office attitude to our former colonies. He is viciously satirizing the image that the Commonwealth Office, and to be truthful, the Queen herself has yes. of the value visiting a colony will provide that she will be met at the airport by. And then he uses those terms, grinning pickaninnies, in order to nail home the outdated attitude of the Commonwealth Office to its manipulation of, you know, good, popular, uplifting footage of the Queen being visited and being greeted by her former subjects who, with whom she still manages. It's, it's ridiculous to say that he, he simply nakedly expressed his attitude to black children as being that. He was writing a very, I think, like, acute attack on the culture of, of the of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But of course he himself couldn't come out and say once he was once he was Foreign Secretary, I was attacking the very thing of which I am now the head. Because, you know, so he just had to let it wash. But that happens again and again and again whenever whenever people say, oh, he likened Muslim women to letterboxes and 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 you yeah. know well Yes, OK, he did get a cheap laugh out of that. But the the overall thrust of that column was overwhelmingly on the side of liberty, of letting people decide for themselves how they dress and of maintaining a, an attitude towards Islam, which is, for instance, vastly more liberal than that of France, you yeah. know, the, who, from whom we are supposed to have cut ourselves loose in order to be able to pursue our own fascist agenda. I mean, this is, I think, a really important point. I was talking to Toby Young on my podcast last time about exactly that case of the, the Boris Johnson racial slur accusation, mm. because I fell for it myself, because I did a stand-up bit about how he uses yeah. these, this, I mean, back, you know, this, in the, and then I read the article and I found exactly what you're saying. It was yeah. satirical. Yeah. And it was clearly satirical. 
but a lie had been allowed to be promoted that anyone could have checked.、Mm. I was lazy enough not to, right? But that now makes me mistrust every media narrative. Absolutely. There was something I can't remember what the term was. You might know. It's a legal term, and I should remember it. Somebody was talking about why why、um, they were analysing the Amber Heard Johnny Depp case, and they said this is why they had to find for Johnny Depp because Amber Heard had definitely, provably lied. And misrepresented a few things, and they were, for instance, she made a case that there were two photographs which had been taken on two different occasions. But in fact, they clearly had been t- the same photograph. One of them had been subjected to a bit of white balance shift, w- where she was trying to demonstrate she had a bruise. And there was this Latin phrase which means something like "lies once, thus the entire testimony is null and void." Right. If you make if if you are proven to have lied once in an entire testimony. Your your case is is gone because it shows that you are willing to do so. Yeah, exactly. You cannot be trusted. Therefore, it's out. And I don't know whether it's part of American law or, or British law. It might even be Roman law. It might even be more,、uh, you know, a proverb or like something yeah, that yeah. Seneca would say or something. But it it was a powerful statement. I thought that is very interesting. That is exactly, and so ironically, how I now feel about those who tell me what Boris has done wrong over、yeah. the years. I know he's lied. He definitely has lied, and I do not trust him either. Yeah. But I don't trust the evidence of the people who say they know what he's done. And it's continuous now. This seems to be the the, the ends justify the means here. I mean,、uh, in Douglas Murray's recent book, which I'm just reading at the moment, it's a really interesting account of the Rhodes Must Fall case,、yeah. where he shows how the quotations they attributed to Rhodes they had sexed up. They'd added racial slurs. Into the quotations that weren't even there in the source material, flat out lies.、Yeah. Well, if they do that once, like you've said, again, I don't trust anything they've done. Don't got to trust、say. them. No, and it's a calculation. They know what they're doing, as they、yeah. do with those things, because they'll inflame student emotions. You know, students who will quite rightly. I mean, my own kids. You know, my daughter's eighteen. I sent her once a.、Um, she had been angry with my.、Um, Uh, objections to the Black Lives Matter movement, and and I think football was taking the knee or something. We'd had a bit of a sort of heated discussion around the dinner table, as you do sometimes with、yeah. a seventeen-year-old daughter. And I sent her by WhatsApp a、um, a segment from Tucker Carlson on Fox. Oh, but that's which is <laughs> that's I, I don't think she would know who he was or、oh, really? what, what,、okay. what Fox represented. But it was a purely factual account of every single unarmed black man who'd been killed in the in the last year by uh, um, American police, saying who they were, where they were, what they were suspected of doing. I mean, detail, and and importantly, the detail included who the officer was who had shot them. Yes, which in I think the majority of cases was female. Right, almost. Like I think seven out of eleven or something like that. I might have that wrong. There were eleven men who'd been shot, unarmed、yes. men, just eleven, mis mis、uh, estimated by orders of magnitude by almost everyone in America, and especially on the liberal tendency, they think there are thousands every year. Eleven in a year,、yeah. unarmed, shot by police, mostly by women who I will go out on a limb and say possibly feel more afraid in confrontations with an unarmed black man who they don't know whether he's carrying a knife or a gun or what. Possibly in that situation. At least half the officers overlapping with the women had been not white. Right. You know the idea that these were like, like white supremacist murders, extrajudicial killings by、yeah. some sort of you know right wing death squad that has been harboured within the. It was just shattered by this. Yeah. Absolutely detailed accounts, and all I did was send her that that clip. The next thing I hear is my wife coming up to me and saying Matilda is desperately upset that you are sharing this. Kind of propaganda with her, you know. But but this is Tucker Carlson outlining the facts. Yeah, it was a it, very very simple, straightforward, dry account with photographs yeah, and yeah. data from the FBI. You know, so I went up and I spoke to her, and we got I calmed her down, and 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 we went through it together. And eventually, I mean, I don't want to summarize it with I won, but you know, I I convinced her that this was this was factual documentation. That this was yes, Tucker was drawing attention to it because he doesn't like. The lies of the left, who are trying to start a race war, but, but you know these are dry facts, and you have to accept them. Yeah. But the extraordinary amount of hostility towards that that kind of confrontational, you know, a, a fact that、yeah. that goes against your narrative, or the just, willingness to dispense with it, and that's exactly what Rhodes Must Fall can do with women exactly like my daughter. You know, she'll she'll be eighteen. She's eighteen now. She'll be off to university next year, and I know. 
that she will be prey to this kind of stuff. And I also know, of course, that if I'm not very careful, any attempt I make to mitigate it will only be seen as white fragility, brittleness, you know, um, you know, essentially yeah, a ma yeah. manifestation of my guilt and, and, uh, and all the rest of it. So that, you have to be very careful. That's the worry, isn't it? Dispensing with facts when they don't suit your yeah. preconceived notions is the opposite of what education's about, isn't it? Or, or, you know, and it just and seems I'm not so saying prevalent. Tucker Carlson should form part of a liberal education. You know? <laughs> it would be ideal if she was getting that information from, from more reliable and you know, neutral sources. But try finding that on the... Sorry, but try finding that on the BBC, you know? And yeah. I do like... I'm, not, I'm much less harsh on the BBC generally than a lot of people in this channel or elsewhere are. You know, I think it does a lot of things terribly well, the BBC, but yeah. they, they absolutely do not share that kind of information. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the future of comedy, because I mean, well, who knows? But I, I, I like to feel that we'll enter a realm where the, the culture war is now irrelevant to the comedic world, because it just seems to dominate so much of, 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 of what we do now. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think things go back. That's the thing. Right. You know, nothing ever goes back, does it? If you look at where did where did like our business start with? I don't know. Dan Lino or something, or you know, or uh, was it musical? Was that Variety? I yeah, but you a, know, yeah. But there was a there was a process, wasn't there? Yeah, it goes through various stages. You know, in the sixties, you had the satire boom, and then that probably gave way to in the seventies. There was something much more close to, you know, um, Monty Python and um, uh, not the nine o'clock news. Yeah. Maintain, and then alternative maintain the the sort of Oxbridge elite. But meanwhile, you had the you know the the, the golden age of British sitcom in the seventies and the eighties. That was a much more inclusive sort of form of comedy. In the 90s and early 2000s, the panel games seemed to be king on, on television. You know, comedy clubs have probably had their heyday in their current sort of form. The, the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, again, were a golden era for live stand-up. I don't think there's quite the same sense of excitement. We're not all waiting now to see who the next Harry Hill, Eddie Izzar, Bill Bailey, Jenny Eclair, Joe Brand, Jack D. These people are, you know... It's like David Hepworth wrote a book about rock stars from 1955 to 95. I think it was 40 rock stars, one per year. And he said, I'm sorry, but it's over now. You know, there yeah. are still people who can get a lot of money and fill a stadium. But the era of the rock star as a cultural phenomenon is over. We see through it. We understand it. Nobody kind of, uh, you know, puts Bowie on their wall in the way that we did in the 70s. You just can't do that anymore. It would take too much of a self, you know, you, uh, um, too much of a, a, a suspension of disbelief, you know. Well, I just wonder if it's because, like, I exactly, I agree with you. When I think back to the big, massive comedian stars, there was a sort of energy and excitement around them, which seems absent now, even from the ones who fill stadiums. Well, you go to Russell but, Brand. I mean, right. that's, you know, he's the sort of guy who can fill stadiums, but he's not a comedian, is he? So what, what but is it just that I'm getting older and, and no, 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 I'm, not, I'm not excited by things anymore? <laughs> no, other things will move on, but you never know what it is. I mean, I think I think rock music is something in a way that was a bigger, more exciting and universal thing than, than stand up comedy was, despite our not being involved in it. And that's kind of gone. And I think also what's replaced that? Well, you'd probably say video games to some extent. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, I mean, and, and even even when I say the words video games, I, I probably am not using the up to date term, you know, but I know my son disappears into his his little pod where he plays um, Xbox with his mates and they link up and stuff far more often than he does go and put headphones on. He also plays rock guitar. He has posters of Prince and, and Hendrix on the wall. He, he's, a, he's a really good um, lead guitarist, you know. It's great, but he does it as a hobby. It's not yeah. a part of the way that he um, integrates with his gang, you know. They yes. regard him as a bit of a weirdo and outsider for doing that. So he has that, you know, and then there's... I took them up on a road trip uh, recently, him and a couple of mates, and we we did a kind of take it in turns to pick out the you know the tune on Spotify, and two of them are like really hard into hip hop, you know, right. and these are like white privately educated teenagers, you know, but that's that's penetrated their world, and I think it was pretty you know sincere their love of it. There's always something else that they're moving on to and moving into, and I don't know what it'll be with comedy. People will always need to laugh, but they'll find new ways of doing it. I don't actually feel that desperate for the comedy industry. I just I don't think I'm capable of keeping up with current trends all the time. I'll probably just carry on doing what I'm doing yeah. and, and hoping that I can keep it going long enough to, you know, see out my uh, my functioning years. But um, uh, you know, it's you know when you get a, a, a cut in your in your skin. Um, I think when I was young, I used to think, oh, you, you know, you put a plaster over it and 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 it heals. Which, by which you mean the two sides that were that were cut apart, come together and sort of forge again, you know, fuse. That isn't what happens. 
those two halves will never again grow again. What happens is new skin is generated from the inside. And as it grows up layer after layer, the old skin that was cut apart dries up and turns eventually into crust and flake and dust and comes off and all the dust in your house is old skin. And that's what I think culture is like. It doesn't, we won't re-knit. We'll just grow old, you know, and new people will come along who won't have been through Brexit, you know, who won't have been through the culture wars and who will just have a new set of preoccupations and ideologies that they're crazy about. And we'll find talking about trans granddad, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, get over yourself, you know. Well, I really hope you're right. <laughs> Simon, thank you so much. You're welcome. This has been the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle, and my guest, Simon Evans. Simon, as you know, has been a stand-up comic for 25 years, but thanks to a couple of years of pandemic, uh, he's been uh, focusing on think pieces and opinion pieces for various columns, and you can check those out. Things like Spiked, Unheard, Quillette, and The Critic, and all of those will be available online. So do check those out. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you like and subscribe, tell your friends, and of course, Come and join me next week where I'll have another fabulous guest. See you then.